I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Media Space. Our show seeks out the collision points between media and technology. We talk to the creative thinkers on the hot button issues of our digital age. Together, we'll find out how these entrepreneurial innovators are changing our lives right now and what's next. In this episode, Nathan Mirvold was named one of the world's top thinkers by Foreign Policy magazine last year. He's a trained physicist, a certified French chef, and a wildlife photographer. Nathan was also Microsoft's first chief technology officer. More recently, he has built a business around invention and intellectual property as CEO of Intellectual Ventures. Now, this modern-day da Vinci is focused on what some are calling the cookbook to end all cookbooks, the 2400-page modernist cuisine. Standing at the crossroads of science and food, is this the future of cooking? And as Nathan seeks to bring innovation into the kitchen, what does he have to say about the state of innovation in our region? We'll also bring you into our discussion. Use the Twitter hashtag for F-O-U-R Peaks, P-E-A-K-S, and we'll track your questions. Nathan, welcome. Well, glad to be here. <laughs> so 2,400 pages, 3,500 photos, 1,600 recipes, 1.1 million words, and I think your press package says, if lined up side by side, six miles long in terms of those words. $625, why? My favorite statistic, four pounds of ink. <laughs> Just the ink alone, Just not the, the paper. Just the ink, not the paper. No, when they first made the, when you go to the printer to arrange a book, they show you the, uh, these blank books. And so I said, hey, is this the same weight it'll be? And I, I meant the paper weight. And the guy says, oh, there's the ink. I said, you're kidding. And they said, well, thousandth of an inch times 2,400. <laughs> That's like a big chunk of ink, four pounds. So, so why are you doing this? Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we realized that there was an opportunity to uh, create a big, comprehensive book that would cover a lot of innovations that have occurred in cooking over the course of the last 10 years, and with roots that go back even farther. So uh, some of that is the interest of, in science in, uh, in the kitchen. So people like Harold McGee and a variety of other authors have already explored the idea that science actually is relevant to cooks and to people uh, cooking. Uh, there's a set of chefs like Ferran Adria uh, in Spain, Heston Blumenthal in the UK, uh, Grant Ackett's or Wiley Dufresne or Jose Andres in the United States that have been innovating in ways that create strange new food experiences in part inspired by science, in part inspired by a desire to do something wild and new. And you said this has been sort of culminating over the last 10 years. What explains this confluence? Why is it happening now? Well, you know, it's like many things that occur in society where you say, well, wh why are we all, you know, doing Twitter and um, uh, you know, online things and blogs now? Well, part of it's enabled by technology. Part of it's enabled by social trends and dynamics. People didn't have the idea before that. Uh, Twitter is a great example of something where the idea could have happened five years earlier. The world didn't have it. Um, so it, the right confluence of need and opportunity and innovators actually who push forward. You know, if you had all of the food science information but you didn't have chefs that were really using it in the kitchen in an innovative way, it'd be less interesting. Uh, if the chefs were ready to innovate, but they had no topics to innovate on, there was no technology, there was no uh, new insights they could gain, well, that wouldn't have been very interesting either. So for whatever reason, this confluence came together, and it's been been pretty amazing. And you, you've called this a bit of a, a risk or a flight of fancy, but I'm looking at a, a recent, <laughs> this is the Amazon.com yeah. top-selling cookbooks. You've, you've, you've bested the Barefoot Contessa. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and you're at I mean, $625 list, which is an incredible price for a cookbook. So why do you think anybody would want to spend that much money for a cookbook? Well, they obviously are already. It, it's unique. It's unique. It's different. Uh, it, uh, if you bought the same number of pounds of other cookbooks, it would cost you about the same amount. Uh, if you tried to find the same information, you couldn't. I think that's probably the, the most interesting part of this for us is that uh, the information that we put in the book, the knowledge about how to use these new techniques, the recipes, the techniques, uh, almost all of them are already out there. We, we invented a few ourselves in the process of making the book, but mostly they were out there, but not out there that you could get unless you went and you were an apprentice at this one restaurant in Spain or this restaurant in the UK or this restaurant in Chicago. And so if you spend a couple years apprenticing all those different places, 
you might learn what, a good chunk of what's in the book, but most people can't do that. And creating a big comprehensive book that would bring that all together into one work was too ambitious an undertaking for publishers to be interested in. And you've got the food blogosphere quite excited about this. Uh, one of your biggest fans, Seattle Food Geek, uh, mm -hmm. said you put him into an existentialist crisis. I love this quote from him. <laughs> Imagine that you were with Lewis and Clark mapping your way across the uncharted expanse of North America, struggling to find passage to the West Coast. One day you meet a passing traveler who pulls out a laptop and shows you Google Maps. It might mess with your head a little bit, huh? <laughs> and that's basically what he's saying modernist cuisine is doing, is messing with his head. But people who are really into what you're doing think this is going to revolutionize cooking as we know it. It's not for me to say whether it's going to uh, completely revolutionize cooking or it's just going to have a more modest impact. Uh, we're thrilled people are excited by it. We've taken a body of knowledge that is very hard to get out otherwise and made it accessible potentially to lots of people. And we'll see how many really want to do that. Now this is your kitchen, right? Yep, this is our laboratory kitchen in Bellevue. It used to be East Side Harley Davidson when we took it over. Uh, we converted it into a lab, both for Intellectual Ventures, my company, where we do lots of science experiments, we uh, prototype in new inventions. A corner of it, we decided to turn into the cooking laboratory, where we uh, develop new kinds of cooking technologies, uh, both because we invent things and also because we are making the book. And does this mean, I mean, if this takes off the way it seems to be taking off, does this mean that even though only 60% of the recipes you believe to be truly accessible to the average kitchen, do, will we see some kind of revolution in terms of what we're using in the kitchen from an appliance point well, of view? So if you sit, took a, a, a kitchen with a pressure cooker, that's probably 60% of the recipes, roughly. If you said uh, everything that you can buy in Sur La Table or Williams-Sonoma, well then you bring in a whole bunch of new things and maybe you're up to 80%. And that difference between that 50, 60, and, and 80 is that there are some new pieces of equipment. There's things called water baths, um, for example, for doing sous vide cooking, and a variety of other uh, vacuum packers, um, uh, injectors for doing injection marinade, um, basically a big syringe. Okay, we're going to listen a little bit to you explain, uh, well, actually, you can explain to us what this is all about. So we're making an omelet here where uh, one of the features of the omelet is it's got stripes built into it. And we use this device I'm demonstrating here, which is a uh, pastry comb. It's basically a big toothed spatula. Uh, and the way it works is you make a, 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 a mushroom puree with egg in it. You use the spatula to scrape it across a flat surface, like a, usually we use a nonstick thing. And then here you can see the striped omelet that results. This toothed spatula makes the dark stripes. Then you pour in egg to fill in the rest of the thing. And then you uh, bake it in a steam oven. Now, is that just good-looking food, or is there a scientific reason for these stripes? The taste from the mushroom gets merged into the omelet, but mostly it's because it's a cool presentation. It looks <laughs> great. Now, um, I think some of the media coverage you've received has kind of p tried to pitch you against the slow food movement, specifically Alice Waters, Waters from Chez Panisse, who s some people say this is a very processed way of going about food. How do you respond to that? Well, I, I love Alice Waters' food. Um, I've eaten at Chez Panisse for many years. Uh, she's among the chefs who had a very influential impact on uh, getting better ingredients. Uh, and uh, the farm-to-table movement is the extension of that. I love all that. Okay, starting with bad ingredients is not a good idea. At the same time, this idea of processed food, when people say processed, usually what they've pictured in their head is packaged food at the supermarket that's stale and made in a big factory and isn't very good for you. Uh, but think about pasta as an example. Pasta is a highly processed food. Um, pasta doesn't go on a tree. You, know, you, you don't harvest the pasta leaves. You take grain. You, there's a whole process by which you mill the flour, and then you make the pasta. So pasta is a completely artificial, completely highly processed food. It's a human invention. It's wonderful. Now, if you think that processed means bad because you're thinking of packaged food in the supermarket, I think you need to then pick some other word because uh, th the idea that a human chef using creativity and knowledge, experience, and some technology creates a new food that is unlike what the original ingredient is, I think that can be great. And pasta is an example. Bread is an example. So I think that using creativity of the chef and technology and technique enhances 
great natural ingredients, not detracts. And that's a funny thing because I've actually noticed in, in all the coverage and people when they intellectually, when they hear about what you're doing, some of them throw up their hands and say, you know, it's the idle, I've read some of these comments, it's the idle smart rich showing off how idle smart and rich they are, gilded food for jaded palates, but once they taste it, especially that Wall Street Journal article recently about it, it's like, it's, it's heaven. I mean, Scott Macklin, who's the executive producer of the show, was at your labs and he said it was the best roast chicken he's ever had. So there must be something that's going on there that you're actually bringing out the best uh, natural taste of these things, but just trying a, a new scientific approach to essentially enhancing this food. Not enhancing it, but sort of making the best of it, it sounds like. In fact, we've got some footage of the roast chicken being prepared. Maybe we can hear a little bit of that. Okay. They've been roasted so, for four to five hours I think at actually. very low temperatures, and they're about to go into a very hot oven. You can read it here, it's 540 Fahrenheit in the oven. And they'll go in the oven for just a few minutes to make the outside super crispy. So we, it, it's actually a very long process. It takes a couple days. You, we inject a brine into the breast, but not into the legs. We hang them upside down like that because we find it actually cooks much better if they're hung upside down. Um, the traditional way to truss chicken makes the legs underdone, which most people don't want. Um, and then by cooking it, by baking it at so very low So days for this particular hours. recipe, there, you also have this incredible recipe for a hamburger or a cheeseburger mm -hmm. where it takes 30 hours to actually cook the burger in this, through using the sous vide technique. These are, you're, you're really looking at cooking from a very different point of view. It's really amazing. Um, when people sort of say, well, this sort of changes my notion of what it means to prepare food, um, what's your best justification for saying, you know what, this, this is worth it. This is worth the time, it's worth the effort. Well, it depends on how you feel about quality. So if you want to make a hamburger, here's our hamburger photo. It's um, an incredible photo, by and, the way. Yeah, we, we tried to have cool photos to illustrate the, the technique. Food doesn't have to be a fancy kind of food to care about quality. It's perfectly legitimate to ask the question, how can I make the ultimate hamburger? Well, if you say ultimate, we'll roll up our sleeves and we'll figure out the best way to do it, the best way to make the bun. The, we infuse uh, smoke flavor into the lettuce. Uh, we make a special cheese slice where the, when the cheese melts, it doesn't separate out and get greasy. Um, we grind the meat in a very particular way so that we align all of the, the grains of meat. We cook it in a very specific way using liquid nitrogen uh, as one of the steps in cooking it. And each of those adds a refinement to a basic burger. Now, if you like the burgers at Dick's or Burger Master or someplace like that, you know, go for it. That there's Some people do, and I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with that. But if you want to refine it and say, what's the ultimate expression of a hamburger, we put a bunch of effort into figuring that out. Now, you're going to be recognized really soon, actually, by the Gourmand Hall of Fame in France for this book. It's very rare that I actually put a cookbook into the Hall of Fame. I think they do it once a year. And mm -hmm. so the fact that they're already recognizing this, it seems to me that this could potentially have this revolutionary impact on the way we cook. Uh, Business Week magazine even said this may be one of the most comprehensive books written about anything. So it's already having this kind of, this, the, these consequences. Uh, does that make you feel like the bet's paid off already? Well, it's premature to, set, to declare victory at this stage. You know, the, the book, the, the uh, first uh, boatload of books docked at the port of Seattle Thursday, Friday, okay, of last week, a few days ago, and the books are, are being shipped off to distributors and then off to end users. So I, I don't want to declare victory pre prematurely, but I'm thrilled with how it turned out, and I'm thrilled that so far the initial responses we've gotten from people have been very positive. Two years ago we made a decision, which I still think was the right decision, that an old-fashioned paper-based book is still the best way to deliver it. Frankly, if you look at the target audience we're trying to reach, chefs, people who love food, and so forth, yeah, some of them have iPads, but not very many of them have iPads. So today, it's still better to make a paper-based book than it is uh, an online book. Also, ironically, there's never been a better time in history to make a paper-based book. Why is that? The digital tools for laying it out are fantastic. There's these terrific um, printers around the world. We used a printer in China. We send um, uh, files from uh, uh, various Adobe products back and forth uh, uh, to them. They would uh, send the, print, the proofs back. Uh, they use interesting digital technology in making something called stochastic screening. It's a technology for actually making the um, uh, photos, reproducing them, that's infinitely better than a traditional um, halftone. So 
When you add it up, there's never been a better time to physically make a book. There's also never been a better time for a book to find an audience. Uh, you know, the success that we've gotten with the, the book so far, which I'm you know, wrap on wood, I don't want to uh, take things for granted, it's due to the internet. It's due Word to Twitter. Mouth. It's due to bloggers. It's due to an entirely new way of promoting a book. And the reason that I decided to self-publish it is, you know, by getting it distributed online, by doing uh, deals with a few book distributors like Ingram, uh, and by promoting it in the appropriate way, we can reach an audience that we just couldn't have reached in a traditional fashion. I think it's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to speak to you about this because you're in many, in so many ways, you've created a disruptive work here, both from a cooking point of view and from a communication technology point of view. You're basically saying we're going to do it our way. We're going to do something very different here, and it's it's already having an amazing impact. So I think that's uh, I think it's definitely something that's noteworthy from our point of view. So let's break for a minute, and when we return, are we as innovative as we have to be? We're back with Nathan Mirville. Well, Nathan, it strikes me that a, a, a man of your many interests, you're made for TED Talks, and you've given a number of TED Talks. And one of my favorite ones is that you're, you're talking about some of the crazy ideas that you've pursued, including one about uh, penguin poop. And you meet this woman in a, in a hotel somewhere in some exotic land, and, and, and she sees what you have on your laptop, and she says, who are you, and what do you do? <laughs> well, who are you, Nathan Mirvold, and what do you do? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard for... The, the stuff that I do does seem weird. I admit that. But it all makes perfect sense to me. And so I have a hard time answering the question. Uh, you know, I'm into cooking, but I'm also into inventing and photography and, and sometimes even penguin poop. In fact, Malcolm Gladwell in a recent article in The New Yorker said, you are nerdy on an epic scale. <laughs> I thought that was kind of a backhanded compliment. I, mean, I, I viewed it as a compliment. <laughs> so we're, I mean, we're... The difference between you and the average person is that we all have ideas, but you have ideas and you f seem to focus on them insanely and pursue them to the nth degree. I mean, where do these ideas come from? Well, they pop in my head. There's a penguin poop. Or right I get, yes, that's, <laughs> that's, that's penguin poop. Um, so ideas come to me. Um, uh, or I see other ideas of other people and recognize them. So I, I certainly use many ideas that I didn't originate myself. Uh, because originating the ideas yourself is, it's great if you've got a good idea, but if someone else has a better idea, you've got to be open to using theirs. And that's the interesting thing. I've seen so much recent literature. There's the penguin poop. There's the penguin with projectile penguin poop. Yes, that was a lucky <laughs> shot on my... <laughs> <laughs> you took that picture yourself. I took the photo, you bet. Wow. Um, there have been a number, uh, like Stephen Johnson's uh, Where Good Ideas Come From, a lot yeah. of conversation that it's no longer about the crazy solitary inventor. It's about people getting together and sort of thinking these things through or these ideas developing not totally separate from on different corners of the world. How do you and your team brainstorm? How do you think these so things up? We, we have an attitude that says if you want to have new inventions, you should set out to do it. Now, right away, that, that breaks a lot of people's preconceptions because they think, oh, you have to wait for the eureka moment and you have to struggle in the lab or be singing in the shower when all of a sudden eureka strikes. We say, no, 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 no. Let's get some really smart people. Let's make sure they're briefed and so they understand what the problems are about and they've done some background information so that they're, they're not coming at it totally cold. Then let's put them in a room and let's see what happens. Let's see if we can get people to come up with cool ideas. And how's that working out for you so far? Uh, it's working out great. Um, we produce thousands of new ideas uh, every year. We can't afford to file patents on all of them, but we file more than 500 patents a year on our new ideas, um, most of which come from this brainstorming process or from the process of refining the ideas afterwards. Sometimes it's not the first brainstorming session where you have the best idea. It's the second one when you're trying to refine a problem with an idea you had the first time out. And some of these ideas, such as... Um building a, a fence to contain malarial mosquitoes using lasers or uh, using nuclear waste to actually power nuclear reactors. Um, this means Intellectual Ventures is not a venture capital company, is it? It's actually an invention capital company. What exactly. does that mean? So venture capitalists fund businesses, uh, a business that usually doesn't exist beforehand, but they fund a business. And someone comes to them and says, here's my business plan, and I have an idea and a plan and a team. And the idea is about, for, of a venture capitalist is let's make a business. We fund inventions. So we fund inventors before they have an invention. 
uh, is that we, we actually recruit the inventors to come to an invention session uh, and say, let's try to think up a solution to this really hard problem. Where the asset to us is the invention, not a company. R&D isn't done very much in companies. Second of all, to the degree it's done, it's done to solve problems. And that's great. But invention is a subversive process by its very nature. Um, you know, famous story of a guy at 3M trying to make glue. The glue doesn't stick very well. He comes up with the idea of post-it notes. Fantastic invention. 3M has come up with lots of them. But even so, when you read his uh, book about this, it's all about how all of the obstacles thrown up to someone creating a new invention. In fact, in general, society and business throws up way too many obstacles. Now, um, I've, people have said wonderful things about you. One of the not so wonderful things is that they, some people call you, and this is a really awful word, but patent troll, and that part of your business model is about creating these patents or buying these patents and then defending them to the nth degree. Uh, you hadn't, in your Harvard Business Review article of last year, you said you actually hadn't gone out and had a lawsuit yet, but you re most recently in December have actually initiated one. How do you respond to this, this charge? Well, I think people don't understand the uh, life cycle of invention. You know, we're trying to treat inventions as being valuable. And if inventions are valuable and people can invest in them, there'll be lots of funding for them. If you invest in invention, you'll create some inventions that fail, but you'll also create some inventions that will change our world. And if you make a professional um, group of people, invention capitalists, that invest in invention, we'll get billions of dollars uh, of new capital to come into the invention field, which is a good thing. But if you ask people to invest, they actually have to treat it like a business. And for a variety of reasons, that feels threatening to people. So when venture capital first came out, it was called vulture capital by a lot of people, and it attracted a lot of negative feedback. And most people today would say, oh, that was kind of silly, and you know, where would we be in a world that had no Google and no Facebook and no um, Amazon or, or Microsoft or Oracle? or Apple, all of those companies that are critical parts of the way we live our everyday lives were created because venture capital was out there. Well, similarly now in our space, I say, look, we are going to invest in invention. It's very threatening to people. And people call you names. And they say what you're doing is terrible, um, and so forth. And when they focus on it to that ex degree, it, it becomes so extreme that you say, well, gee, that's got to be because it's feeling threatening to an old or order. And, you know, I think that's probably true. Things, it is threatening to the old order. In the same way that an iPhone is threatening to everybody else in the smartphone space, and in fact, smartphones in general are threatening to people in the old phone space, and all of that is threatening to the wireline business. I mean, how, how much do you live your life around your wired telephone anymore? So it's no doubt that you, then you are, in, in so many ways, the harbinger of, of the new order. You said recently, I think it was in the Financial Times, that you believe that in many ways the USA is the, the new Europe or the next Europe. And I don't necessarily think that was meant as a compliment. Does that mean that our country or even our region is not as innovative as we should be in this day and age? Or we're we losing out competitively? Um, I think where the United States is losing out competitively is in the traditional industries. You know, in manufacturing, uh, it, it's hard to manufacture things on a cost-effective basis in the United States. Uh, you know, China and other parts of the world do it cheaper than we do. Uh, in printing my book, Modernist Cuisine, we looked all over the world. We were mostly interested in quality first rather than price. And the best quality printer that we found was in China. And people said, oh, you printed in China because you wouldn't pay for a real printer in the U.S. It's kind of the opposite. I could get better quality printing in China than I could in the U.S. And so it is sad to see that we are... Uh, manufacturing a bunch of areas, we've taken some big hits. Uh, I don't think we should give up on it. I think what that means is we should be innovative and think hard. And there's no better place to come up with a new business idea and have people support it than the United States. At the same time, there's people who get all worked up about China and they say, oh my god, they're graduating all these people in China. And, and, and then they say, isn't that terrible? And I say, no, I'm not going to say it's terrible. I'll say that the US should do a better job. But I think it's great that China is developing. Um, having a larger market worldwide for technology is good for the whole tech business. 
uh, having more smart people. You know, these, oh my God, they're graduating so many engineers in China. Good. I mean, th there's some kid in China who's going to go into molecular biology in the next few years who 20 years from now might invent a drug that saves my life. How mad should I be about that? Um, you know, it's true that the United States has gotten complacent in a bunch of areas. Being number one for a long time gets you complacent that way. Um, it's true that we have, uh, we've made ourselves un uncompetitive in a lot of different ways. But I don't want to throw in the towel. I think what we, it means is we should learn from those th uh, things. Learn what the rest of the world is doing better than we are and see if we can one-up them on it. And be innovative. Come up with new ideas. You know, in the middle of the 19th century, the United States was still an agricultural country. We were a third world country at that point. We were a little bit like you might think of Brazil today. Um, you know, big, lots of potential, but still very much the Wild West. In fact, that's what the middle of the... In fact, we, we also fought a brutal civil war in the middle of the 19th century. But around that time, amazingly, we became the world's greatest inventors. So Thomas Edison and Morse with the telegraph and tons of other people started inventing. And that has been a theme. Even before we were an industrial power, we were the world's inventing power. And I think we can continue to be an inventing power even after a phase where the center of industrial production isn't going to be the U.S. anymore. Well, I think, I think that's a great way to leave things. Join us at livestream.com slash mcdm for Four, Four Peak Salon. Nathan and other thought leaders will discuss whether the Pacific Northwest is ready for the future when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship. Thank you all for joining us today. Tune in again next month online and on air for our next episode of Media Space. I'm Hanson Hossein.